about open triads, spread triads, uh, two names, two different names for the same thing. Uh, one of my students was working on them and I hadn't uh, given a PDF or anything. I was just talking about them and, and then he started working on them on his own and said, God, you know, some of the shapes are really awkward and so uh, uh, talked to him a little bit more and, and found that he, and he was just kind of trying to find the shapes on his own and, and not looking for places where they might be kind of easy. So a spread triad is, or an open, an open voiced or spread triad, we call it that as opposed to a closed position triad. A closed triad is a triad where the three notes are as close together as they can be, uh, not just on the guitar, but if you saw them on a music staff. So uh, right now I'm playing A major. So that's root three, five. If you saw that on a music staff, th th those would be three uh, a is the second space, C sharp would be on the third space, and uh, E would be uh, the top space. That's pretty close together, it's, it's less than an octave. And even if we use uh, an inversion, if we do the, um, if, we, if we go to the first inversion, which you could play here or here, uh, things are still pretty close together. That's C sharp to E, that's a third. E to A is a fourth, so things are a little more open. Here, you've got two thirds. This is the distance of a major third. This is the distance of a minor third. Now we've got a minor third, perfect fourth. So it, it got bigger, but it's still considered a closed position triad. Everything is contained in, a, in, you know, in less than an octave. A second inversion, we could play up here. We could play it down here, I guess. Now we've got the perfect fourth on the bottom and the major third on top. So again, slightly more distance. What I mean by that is if you if you just add up the intervals, like how many half steps is it from A to C sharp? Well, one, two, three, four. Then how many half steps is it from C sharp up to E? Uh, one, two, three. So. Uh, you could say there's four half steps down here and three half steps up there. So the whole span of this uh, is seven half steps. And, and you could check the math by figuring out how far is it just if we go directly from A to E. So uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So the whole thing is that, that much. 
Uh, so these inverted triads are, are slightly bigger. So we go from C sharp to E, one, two, three, and then from E up to A, one, two, three, four, five. So uh, we've got uh, three plus five, right? One, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, as opposed to four plus three. Yeah, it's bigger. <laughs> and then same up here. Now we've got um, from E up to A, one, two, three, four, five. And then A up to C sharp, one, two, three, four. So all of those are, are bigger, but they're still closed triads. So open triads, open triads is when you take any of these three closed triads and move the middle note down an octave, which then results in, uh, now they're kind of broken, it's, it's crossed the octave line. I'll, I'll show you what I mean. So here's this uh, A, C sharp, E, root position, A triad. Um, if we drop the C sharp down an octave, we can, we can get that C sharp over here, or we could get it over here. So let's try it over here. So now we've got C sharp up to A, and then A up to E. Much more open sound. Um, it's you know physically open on the guitar in that we're, we're not using the G string, so there's a gap string. And if we add it up from C sharp up to A is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight half steps, and then from A up to E, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven half steps. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight plus seven half steps. Bigger, open sound, really beautiful. But you know, you have to decide how you're going to get at it. Like this would be an awkward way to play this, but it's the same notes. This is an easier grab. This is a really easy grab. So if you're working on open triads and you're just making them from scratch rather than getting a PDF from some somewhere or, or finding it in a book or online, you might just think, okay, I'm going to move this C sharp down an octave. I'll put it there. That chord's no fun to play. I don't want to play that. But you might miss out that, oh yeah, if you just move this E over, over here, then that becomes pretty easy. Or if we move uh, the C sharp here, then that's pretty easy. And then you can also start to see, you know, the other problem with this chord, besides that it's not that fun to play, is it doesn't seem to look like something that you, you know. And when we're learning new shapes, it's always helpful to relate it to something that, that you already know. So it's going to be hard to relate that to something we know. But this, you could see it's it's really a lot like this uh, D over F sharp where, where you might use your thumb. I guess you could do it without your thumb. I use my thumb. So this shape is part of that. Um, it would be that. Which again, you I don't think you would actually play all of that, but you could recognize that, okay, where my middle finger now is is kind of where my thumb would go and it would look like that so this note is the third and this is the root and the fifth just like down here uh, if we we're playing d over f sharp uh, this is the third uh, this is the root this is the fifth so uh, same shape here and it's relatable to d form uh, if we do it here Is a little harder to see, but it, it comes out of, you know, here's the familiar old A bar chord. So it's just starting on the third. These two notes come out of the same uh, kind of E shape grip. And it also on the bottom looks a little bit like the G shape where this would be the third. So you can think of it as kind of part of both the, the G form and the E form when, when you grab this. And if you wanted to make it minor, 
you could stretch way out here, but I think in that case, I might do this. It breaks the rule of what I just said of like relating it to something familiar, but it's a lot easier to grab. And then there's also this, which again is like this A minor that's up here, but just moving this all the way down to here. So A minor, A major, A minor, A major, A minor, A major. And those are all first inversion open spread triads. Um, if it's got the third on the bottom, we call it first inversion. I know that's confusing, but it's always true. So just memorize it. If it's got the third of the chord on the bottom in the lowest sounding note, then we call that first inversion. So this is first inversion A major spread, as opposed to this, which is first inversion again, because it's got the third on the bottom, but it's not spread. If you've got three strings in a row, chances are you're not playing a spread triad unless you've just got huge hands and can do spread triads uh, uh, on three adjacent strings. So if there's a gap string like there is here or here or here, so in this case, I'm not doing anything on the G string or the A string. In this case, I'm not doing anything on the A string. In this case, I'm not doing anything on the G string. Um, anytime there's a gap string, that's uh, a clue that it's spread. And if there's no gap, then that's a clue that it's not a spread triad. So let's look at um, second inversion. Uh, we want to have the fifth on the bottom. Let's start with this first inversion non-spread triad and drop that middle note E down an octave. So instead of C sharp E A, we're going to have E C sharp A. Again, this is a very recognizable shape, right? Because it comes right out of the E shape. you could do this my student might have stumbled on that and said what the heck is up with that i don't want to play that but this this is pretty easy to relate to there's another way back here and i'm just tucking my fingers away so, so that you can see it you know you don't have to really do that so that that's also a way that's got the fifth on the bottom gap string uh, third string gap think of to do this. Oh, I guess there's this also. Same grip, just different strings. So these are open spread tracks. There's A minor, um, major, minor, major, minor. Um, yeah, those are the sounds. And of course, you, you can also make diminished. So that would be flat third, flat five. So A major. Uh, sorry, A major. A diminished. A major. A diminished. You could do that with all, with all of these. So here's A major, uh, A diminished, A major, um, A major. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's not fun to play. But anyway, th those are those are spread triads. If it's if it's if you're trying to play them and the shapes are just really impossible, look at if if perhaps there's another another way that you could get the same notes in on different strings and, and see if you can grab it. Because once you get these under your fingers, they're a really nice sound. 
So I'll play. What can I play? It's an easy song. I'll just do uh I'll do one six four five. It's not a song, but it's a progression. One six four five. That's all with open uh, spread triads with with the root on the bottom. C A minor F G. Uh, now I'll do it in first inversion. C, A minor, F, G. First inversion, remember, uh, has the third on the bottom. So C major, there's your C. A minor, there's your A. F, there's your F. G, there's your G. What if you wanted to mix and match root position with uh, with the first inversion? So maybe I'll go root position uh, root position C first inversion A minor first inversion F root position G. I'll do that again without talking, so you can really hear. Now let's do second inversion. So second inversion. And now let's mix and match a uh, root position and second inversion. So I'll do C in root position, A minor in the second inversion, F in root position, G in second inversion. gonna mix them all up and 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 uh, use use all all three different types so root position second inversion uh, first inversion F second inversion G not very good voice leading that was kind of random so let's see what happens if we try to create a strong uh, baseline melody so so da, 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 da. we can do that. And that's going to uh, dictate what the upper line, what the melody will be, just by virtue of uh, if we just f uh, build up from the bass, then um, the rest of the chord has to follow. So if we want to do this... That's what we get. What if we want the bass line to be so it could go da 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 da? Then we would wind up with this. If there's a way to do the bass line by step. Um, mm. No, that's not going to be by step. Let's see. Well, this is close. So that's C, second inversion, A minor, root position, F, first inversion, G, uh, first inversion. 
Let's see if we can keep going up. That's another way to go. Good to see you. Thanks for tuning in. I'm talking about spread triads. Um, yeah, that's what I'm talking about. <laughs> um, what are you working on? Uh, what are you working on, Andy? Shuvo Das. Wow, that's a really good question. Uh, I'm going to read the question. I come from a rock slash metal background. I want to learn songwriting in a pop funk, uh, like Stevie Wonder slash Michael Jackson style. Seems overwhelming. Where do I start? Any suggestion would be greatly appreciated. Um... And then Andy's following up with a with a um, that he's says he says great theme with inversions and triads. Can you give more examples of pop or jazzy songs? Well, Alex is here. Hey Adam, great to be able to catch you live here for a change. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'll just take these questions one at a time. Shuvo Das. Uh, well. Yeah, if if you are trying to figure out how to write songs and you're starting with Stevie Wonder, that is going to be overwhelming, uh, regardless of your background, because his his music is really, uh, really deep, and there's a lot going on uh, melodically, rhythmically, harmonically. So that's a pretty big leap if you're coming from rock and metal. I think the thing that I would do is I would kind of go back in time a little bit before before that and 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 look at Motown. Uh, Stevie Wonder started out more in in, um, in the Motown vein where where the songs were simpler. Uh, I mean, Mo, I say Motown, Motown uh, is a record label. Uh, so there's artists that specifically recorded on the Motown label, but there's also just, uh, you know, there's there's songwriters that that worked there and there's a sound. And anyway, it, it's, I would look at Motown records, the label uh, in the 60s, which I think you can find some Stevie Wonder on Motown. Uh, I think his earliest stuff was there before. Before, so because there's also this period in the early '70s when he just uh, has a real creative uh, kind of explosion, and you get um, songs in the key of life and fulfilling this first finale and uh, inner visions and uh, music of my mind and and that, that stuff is a huge leap from from well, from anything and for sure a huge leap from rock and metal so if you start there it will be overwhelming and you might just throw up your hands and and um and quit so don't do that but start with the stuff that's before that and maybe see if you can just kind of work your way forward so the same is true of of michael jackson i would start with the more kind of pop stuff before that, like the Jackson five, when he was recording with the Jackson five. Um, so like, um, st stop the love you save may be your own and ABC. Um, even like, um, uh, dancing machine, uh, you know, start, start there. And then what happens in the, in the seventies, uh, with Stevie Wonder, is just there's a lot more uh, depth 
to the harmony and the melodies. But see if you can kind of, instead of going falling backwards into it from where you are now, go before it and work your way forward. Um, maybe you'll find some songs where where those more sophisticated sounds are just starting to get introduced. So that's what I would do. Uh, study Motown. Uh, just find a Motown playlist, or if you still buy CDs, uh, find yourself like a greatest hits of Motown and, and learn those songs and then kind of work your way forward. Um, and then study some jazz if you can. Uh, I don't have a good book recommendation off the top of my head, but um, if anyone else here wants to recommend a, a book to study jazz harmony, not so much specific to the guitar, but just understanding jazz harmony um, uh, would be useful. You know, Michael Jackson's records, uh, for, for a while he was working with a producer named Quincy Jones, who definitely came out of a, a jazz background. So there's a lot of that influence in, in the, in the, in the production and in the harmony. And, uh, so you're going to need to, to learn, uh, some, some about some how, of how jazz works because that's informing the Michael Jackson stuff. Stevie wonder really I'm almost, I'm hesitant to say study jazz and you'll understand Stevie Wonder because he really operates in a, in his own language. Um, chords move around in a different way in Stevie Wonder songs than they, than they do in jazz. He, he breaks all kinds of rules and it still sounds uh, so beautiful. So uh, study jazz, but be prepared that that Stevie Wonder is going to break a lot of rules. Okay. Um, great. Thanks for recommending that. I was made to love her. That's great. Hmm. Hello, Tommy Umbrella. Thanks for being here. So uh, that was uh, answering Shuvo Das about uh, some, some places to get started. I hope that was helpful. Um, Andy Wilson says, great theme with inversions and triads. Can you give more examples of pop or jazzy songs? Um, sure. Um, um, well, okay. In, I'll do a jazz song and then I'll do a pop song. Because this is actually something specific that I got into with my student who had I think misunderstood what open triads are are good for or even how to grab them on the guitar. So let's say you're going to do uh, All the Things You Are by Jerome Kern. Most people do that in the key of A flat. I mean, most people don't play all, all the things you are, but among the people who play all the things you are, uh, A flat is the kind of familiar key. So it starts on F minor 7. So it goes... If you played it the way most jazz guitar players would play it, you'd have kind of have these chords. Or, you know, something maybe more sophisticated. I'll, I'll do that again with some slightly jazzier chords. Uh, could just play all of that as spread triads. Here's F minor, B flat minor, E flat, A flat, D flat, G, C. We'll do it again. And those were all with the root at the bottom. Uh, you could do it in first inversion.
and I'll, I'll just try a different way to get through that. So you could work on a song like all the things you are using spread triads. Uh, we'll do one more pass here. So try that. Um, uh, a pop song, maybe I'll just do Let It Be. So here's the way you might play it if you weren't using spread triads. Just kind of strummy, open position chords, I guess. Now, if you wanted to do the spread triads, uh, you could do this. Standards here. I love it. Um, Roberto de Valle, de Valle. Hola. Hey, Roberto, thanks for being here. Um, Alex has gone uh, rogue here. Enough with the triads, says Alex. It's like, I want to know about playing over changes. Okay, okay, okay. I'll do it. <laughs> um, the, core, the question is, what's a play on the second chord of Take the A Train? So that's what he's talking about. This is a song... Melody is this note, uh, which is G sharp. And the chord is D7. So when you've got D7 with a G sharp, Alex wants to know what, what scale do I play? And uh, there's two that come to mind. And uh, then I'll see, uh, after I tell you about the, the two common ones that people usually use, We'll see if we can find any other options. So one is uh, people will use the D whole tone scale. So da, da, bu, ba, ba, ba. That's a, a good choice there because uh, that scale has has all the notes that we're getting at. If you play D7 with a 9 and a sharp 4, or sharp 11, all of that stuff is contained. That's, that's all contained in there. So D whole tone is a good idea. That's all 
uh, fair game. Another uh, scale that people often use is uh, A melodic minor, but starting on D, so the fourth mode of A melodic minor. So that's also, you can hear how that makes total sense. So those would be the, the two, I think, that people use most um, commonly. Um, what if we just looked at it like, okay, we're in C, because the thing is, Right after that chord, there's a two five. So this whole passage, this eight bar passage, is all in the key of C diatonic, except for this one kind of weird chord. So because it's D7, we need to have F sharp in there, right? Because that's part of D7. And because the melody note is G sharp, we need a scale that has F sharp and G sharp. So what if we just took a C scale and sharped F and G? So here's C major. And now we're gonna play the C scale again with F sharp and G sharp. We wind up again. That's the same notes we had when we played the fourth note of a uh, fourth mode of a melodic minor, um, which uh, people call that D Lydian dominant. So Lydian is shorthand for this uh, raised fourth degree, and dominant is shorthand for that. Uh, instead of like if we're playing a D whatever scale, the the seven on a D scale. Organically, naturally, is C sharp. It's not organic. It's just, it, it is what it is. Uh, if we were playing D major, we'd have C sharp. So we flat the seven and we raise the four. So D Lydian dominant is a D major scale with a sharp four and a flat seven. And that happens to be the fourth mode of A melodic minor. And it sounds really good on that second chord in Take the A Train. Uh, is there Are there other choices? I guess... Yeah, there probably are some more exotic scales that you could conjure. Like that. I'm so glad that uh, that was a good light bulb moment for you. Yeah, Lydian dominant, it's, that's what it is. Lydian dominant is that. So let me know if you have any questions uh, related to that. Um, uh, Locrian, Andy, uh, please explain because... I'm not sure how low green would make sense there. Um, so if I if I were to play D low green, I 
I mean, it does have the flat five in it, but th that's a lot of change. Uh, that, that's that. Yeah, that's a pretty different sound. It's it's not a bad idea, but I I'm not sure it's justifiable with the idea. I mean, not in the way that I was showing you. Like, let's let's change as little as possible. It's it's a more bold choice, and you know, we're talking about jazz music. You can make bold choices. You can play whatever you want. a beautiful sound i don't think of that as this as 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 being very ellingtonian or strayhornian uh choice for that moment in that song but yeah over d7 you certainly could play d locrian so Setter, I'm going to get to you in a minute. Um, speaking of the whole tone scale over D7 on A train, do you have any favorite whole tone scale licks? I struggle to make it sound musical. Uh, well, I did play a couple of my favorite whole tone licks, which uh, would be stuff that you can do on the, the second and third string because you, you've got this major third, so you're you're set up already to do whole tone stuff. So that's not really a, a, a melody kind of lick. It's just a, a blurry mess that I'll sometimes play. So on D7, if I want to get a whole tone sound. So you can just keep moving in um, whole steps. Um, that's kind of a similar thing can happen on the high strings, I guess. Uh, I'm getting a little double stop here in case it's not clear. So I'm playing here E, uh, then B flat and D with the second finger. And then we can play in whole steps on the first string. You can either move in two fret increments uh, or four fret increments. I think I use those as these kind of jazzy, blurry sounds because when I hear piano players hit that stuff like Thelonious Monk or Duke Ellington, it often seems to be in a blur. They've got something they can do that's just like a big descending thing or um, some kind of worked out handful of stuff that it's not melodic, but just creates this atmosphere. But one, one lick... <laughs> That is that I, I do sometimes still play. I'm laughing because I think I learned this lick when I was 14. Uh, it's from the intro to Stray Cat Strut. So that's that's just a blues lick in C. And then he implies G7 augmented, so he goes. So 
that's so that's a cool way. Here's a Jimmy Weibel lick uh, from Etude, from his Etude Number no. One. Uh, let's see, what is the right fingering? Yeah. So that's if you have like C augmented going to F. So I'll do it slower. Fingers are not cooperating, or my brain is not cooperating. That's correct. And then he, he resolves that to F. Of course, you could do that in any key if you want to. So that's going to, from E augmented to A. Yeah, that's a, those are some good licks. Yeah, <laughs> Jimmy Weibel lick is a bit special. Yeah, Jimmy is special. Ch check it out if you can um, if you can find anybody on YouTube playing Jimmy Weibel Etude One. I might have even uh, done it myself. Um, if you want to email me, I'm glad to send you the music so you can try it out. Um, and anybody, not just Alex, uh, you can email me, Adam at adamlevy.com and I'll send you Jimmy Weibel Etude 1 that will keep you busy for a long time I think um okay um let's see Brandsetter how did can I explain how to make arpeggios blended with a scale west style um I don't know if I can explain it exactly in a West style, but um, when I think of, of um, you know, blending arpeggios with scale with scales, it's because neither one on its own sounds particularly musical uh, I'll try to show show you what I mean um, if, if if let's say you're soloing over C7 if I just play a C7 arpeggio and then the band is playing C7 if I just do this uh, And cooking along, and I just I come out with like I think that's going to get a little bit old. Uh, there's not a lot of color there because if the band is playing C7 and I'm playing just the arpeggios of C7, um, there's there's not much tension or, or release. It's just kind of, I always use this because it's how it seems to me. Like you've got a blue background and you're painting more blue on the blue background. Um, it's just not gonna, it's not gonna tell much of a story that way. So, and, and by the same token, if I just play, you know, C mixolydian, you know, that also is going to sound kind of boring. Um, if you play scales, people 
know that you're playing scales and not melodies. So uh, by combining bits, bits of arpeggio and bits of scale, it, it doesn't automatically lead to great melodies, but at least it gets you out of sounding like you're a freshman in music school and you just learned these, these fundamental things and you're trying to get to making music. So like I could go partly up an arpeggio, like over C7 again. So here's an arpeggio. And already I changed it, so. So I went up a C, and then a B flat major seven. Like you could play that here, but I put the A here instead of here so I could get all the way up here. So, uh, uh, So that's all scales, and I'll do some more arpeggio. It's it's hard. For me, it's hard to talk about how to, how to turn arpeggios and scales into music, which is frustrating. As it might be frustrating for you, it's definitely frustrating for me as a teacher, um, because we all get told early on, like practice your scales and arpeggios and then, okay, now turn them into music. And that seems like a such a big leap. <laughs> so I would encourage more that you learn some lines that if, you, if you're interested in playing like Wes, learn some of his lines, start slow, look at ballads, don't don't try to figure out how he played a really burning solo. Um, start with a ballad. Start with something that you can really hear that because it moves slowly and, it, and there's a little more repetition. And try to learn some of his lines. And then if you're also at the same time practicing some scales and arpeggios, maybe you'll recognize, oh, yeah, that line is really part of this thing. At the At the end of the day, I don't think you really want to play scales and arpeggios when you're improvising, when you're playing music. But understanding where they are on the fretboard and how they work, the mechanics of them, will help any lines that you learn. If you learn a West lick, it'll help it make sense because you can see, oh, like, oh, yeah, that lick is really just part of this thing that I already know. If you're just learning a lick on its own, and you don't have, have the foundational stuff of the scales and arpeggios, uh, that that lick may not be something that you can bring to life. It may just never leave the West solo. It may just kind of hang out there. Um, so, yeah, Stephen, it's if you're if it's confusing from how to turn. The, the fundamental stuff into music, it's hard. It, it, I don't think that's how jazz music gets made. You know, you have to study that stuff, but then you also have to study the work of the giants. And you also have to just create stuff on your own and, and try to get in the headspace of, of playfulness with the material. Uh, it cannot just be by rote in any arpeggio that you learn see see if you can make up a lick that you like any scale that you learn see if you can make up a lick that you like um that's my best my best advice yeah 
Okay, uh, I'm going to have to hop off here uh, briefly, but Andy, uh, uh, under your video, I saw an interesting comment. Now lower the third, raise the fourth, and, and play it again. That was from my friend David Oakes. Um, I was playing something that had to, that was a Jimmy Weibel exercise. Um, yeah, I was playing something diatonic. I, I won't get into the specific exercise because that, that would take more time. But let's say something really simple like a chord scale. Right, maybe, and you can keep going, but I'll just start right there. That might be something that you already know. These would be uh, the diatonic chords in the key of C major. And, and the specific exercise that I was doing in that video is a Jimmy Weibel variation on that. He's he's taking a, a kind of complicated shape and moving it up uh, diatonically uh, up the fretboard. And, and that's what this is, but I'm, I'm showing you one that maybe might be more relatable or accessible. So now uh, what David is saying, okay, do this, but flat the third. So in this case, I'm in the key of C major. If I flat the third, that's E becomes E flat. So I've got to do that not just on the C chord, but on any of the chords that have E in them. So there's E flat. There's an E here, so I've got to flat that. There's an E here, so I've got to flat that. So you get all, all of a sudden these very different chords. Now, what if I flat the third and raise the fourth? The fourth is F. So now any chord with an F in it, I've got to make that F sharp. So we would get this. No F there. F becomes F sharp. F sharp. So check it out. Here's where we started. Now we make all the E's E flat. are flat and all the F's are sharp. If we keep going, the next chord will be G7. It doesn't have an E or an uh, Oh no, the F is sharp. So now we get G major 7, A minor 7 flat 5, B minor 7 not flat 5. Um, I have to run. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in, asking good questions. Um, uh, I'll try to do this again next Wednesday. Sometimes I can, sometimes I can't. Uh, if you want to check out my Patreon, it's guitartipspro.com, or you can go to patreon.com slash guitartipspro. Uh, if you want to see where I'm playing, go to adamlevy.com and... Uh, there's lots of other stuff there besides my gigs and stuff. So thanks. Uh, take care. I'll see you soon.